This is uh, chapter 25, Fluid, Electrolyte Balance, and Acids and Bases for a 2402 lecture. So first off, let's just talk with how much water we have in us and where it is. So when you were a little baby, you were about 75% water. When you get to be an, an elderly person, you'll go down to about 45%. So as you become an adult, uh, you're somewhere in between those two. Males tend to have greater muscle mass and they tend to, a lean male will have like 60% uh, water of their body mass. So if you weigh 200 pounds, 120 of it's uh, water. Uh, female slightly less due to a slightly lower um, muscle, ma uh, muscle density. And as you can see, fat and muscle have considerably different water contents. Fat, you wouldn't think it has much water. It's about only 20%. And uh, muscle, uh, on the other hand, is uh, especially if you're fully hydrated, 75%. Now let's look at how you break it down within a single person. So I've got it broken into intracellular and extracellular. So this will be ICF. I should probably write that down because I'd use it later. This is ICF and this is uh, IF. So those are the only two abbreviations I use. Um, intracellular fluid is uh, about two-thirds of your water and where most of your potassium is. And I'll talk about potassium later. This is within your cells. Now you're mostly cells, so it's not surprising. When you ask somebody where do you think most of their water content is, they probably, most of them would guess blood maybe, blood plasma. That seems like a, a lot of liquid inside of you. But if you look down here, it's extracellular. It's one of the components of extracellular fluid, which is only a third uh, outside of your cells. That, um, of that one third, 26% of it is uh, interstitial fluid in between cells, so lymph and stuff like that. Uh, whereas only 7% of your overall body fluid is, is plasma, so it's a minority. But you also, this is where you find most of your extracellular fluid is where you find most of your sodium and chloride. If you remember back from the, um, from A and P1, when you did uh, muscle and nervous tissue, we talked about action potentials. I, we always started off sodium on the outside of the cell and potassium on the inside of the cell. So that's, that's accurate. Water is able to move back and forth between these compartments. It goes from inter, intracellular to extracellular or interstitial to uh, plasma. Between the plasma and the interstitial fluid, it's going to be at capillaries. So if you think about the plasma as your, your capillaries and the interstitial fluid is going to be the, the fluid around the capillaries. So it can go back and forth. And you can go between uh, interstitial fluid, the component of extracellular, so extracellular and intracellular fluid across the plasma membrane. So you're just going to go directly then across, uh, like here. Here's a, a cell. Here is a capillary, right? So it's going to go like this, and then like this. So you're going to have this kind of a, a chain. They're all connected. Uh, if you drop the fluid from one, you're going to start sucking fluids from the other. And this is where we're going to get into the next thing, uh, ultimately here, when you of uh, dehydration and uh, maybe too much hypo, hypotonic hydration, so the two extremes. Well, water input or intake and output, uh, 250, sorry, 2,500 milliliters, so about 2.5 liters. Now, that is a just basic average, all right? If you are active, it's a lot more than that, right? So I went for a run this morning, and when I came back, I probably drank 2.5 liters right there because I had lost a lot. So if you're running or work outside or it's hot and you're working outside, you're going to lose a lot more, so you're going to have to you're going to have to compensate with intake a lot more. But they're both about the same. They balance out over time. You don't take in more than you lose or else you you know, you you have a net intake and if you don't drink enough, you're going to get dehydrated. So you basically compensate your water intake, about 60, again, ballpark, 60% from beverages, 30% from food, which has liquid in it, has water in it, and 10% is metabolic. Uh, that is that process at the end of cellular respiration where in the electron transport chain, you ultimately combine an oxygen atom with a couple of hydrogens and some electrons to make water. So you're making about 10% of your water need uh, per day just making ATP, so a little bonus. 
Uh, output, most of it again, 60% is urine. This, uh, no, this word right here, insensible, sometimes includes sweat, but I separated them out. So 28% is insensible, and that's gonna be like when you, when you do, right? So I just fogged up my, my glass lens right there. That's water vapor that I'm exhaling, right? I don't have to do the Every time I breathe out, I'm losing water. Uh, additionally, the cells on you, of your skin lose water. The water, these are not perfectly watertight, so you're gonna be evaporating water from the cells of your surface. That's different than sweat. Both, they both evaporate, but sweat is an intentional secretion. The insensible loss from your skin is just transmembrane uh, uh, loss and then evaporation. So this, this sweat bit is intentional to, to cool you off. And then about 4% is of your water loss is in feces. Uh, and I guess that depends on the state of your feces. So normal fecal matter. All right, moving on to thirst and how to fix it. Uh, there are osmoreceptors in your the blood vessels of your hypothalamus that detect the osmolality or osmolarity of your of your blood. So the more concentrated your blood is, so the less water there is, that's going to be a, a thirst signal. So if you if you haven't drank water in a while and your 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 blood is getting more viscous because you you've lost some volume to it, uh, that's going to trigger you to be thirsty. Also, if you've got a dry mouth, right? Everybody, they're all connected, right? This, this uh, concentrated blood leads to dry mouth and blood volume, decrease in blood volume goes along with that. So all three of these things are signals. Incidentally, when those osmoreceptors kick in and tell you that you're thirsty, you start producing, you release ADH, which you remember from the endocrine system, which is going to cause you to conserve water loss. So. If you're thirsty, you're gonna stop peeing as much. Well, how do you get rid of it? Well, you can increase your blood volume by drinking, right? That'll stop you from being thirsty. When you put water in your mouth, it tends to decrease your thirst. Now, it's not a fix. If you're down on two liters of water and you just take a cap full of water in your mouth and ah, you're good, right? No, you're still down almost two liters of water. It's just that temporarily, you're not gonna be as thirsty. This, uh, the mouth moistening and stomach stretching are both meant to prevent you from consuming too much water all at once. Because if you were like down a liter, but there's a lag time in your, in how, when you drink water and when you feel sated, uh, you could actually do some damage by consuming too much water. So this takes a minute to, you know, your stomach stretches out, you're like, okay, I'm good for a second. As soon as you absorb that, if you're still down water, you'll drink some water. What happens if you have too little or too much? Well, if you got too little, it's called dehydration, and there's varying degrees of it. Uh, everybody's been a little dehydrated at, at time uh, once or again, but uh, if you've been out in a, like a lifeboat stuck on the Pacific Ocean for three weeks, you're probably in a bit of a more dehydrated state than me after a run. But like I said, there's degrees. And if you suffer dehydration, well then hopefully you can get to some water and, and fix it. And if you drink too much water, and I mean too much like water. If you're drinking something that's isotonic to your uh, cells and your blood, you're probably gonna be okay, you're just gonna pee a lot. So if you're drinking a lot of, say, Gatorade or something, that's a lot better for you. I don't wanna make any, you know, I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying if you're gonna drink something with some electrolytes in it, that's better to drink too much of than drinking too much water. Because you can actually have a, a potentially fatal disorder called hypotonic hydration. Occasionally you'll hear about uh, fraternity or a radio station. I, I, there was a radio station contest that I'd heard about where they said, we're gonna have some listeners up here and we're gonna see how much water we can drink and the winner is gonna get uh, whatever. Tickets to go see Maiden or something, right? So they had these knuckleheads up there and they were chugging water, just pure water. And what happens is, if you think about it, if I ingest a bunch of liquid that is hypotonic, to my blood and to my intracellu intracellular fluid, the water is going to move from an area where it's concentrated. It's going to move down its concentration gradient. So all of this water is sitting in my gut or in my intestines, right? 
It's going to move across the membranes into my interstitial fluid. It's going to move into my capillaries. It's going to move from those capillaries into the cells of my body, and it's going to swell those cells. So if you really take it to an extreme and drink way too much water, your urinary system is not going to be able to keep up with it, and your cells are going to swell, which can be bad. Uh, you can get uh, nausea and cramps if it's minor, but if you start getting the cells of your brain to swell, uh, you're in trouble, right? People have died from this on multiple occasions. So drink water, just, you know, take, take a, have some control. What's the word? With some, uh, uh, shoot, my words are bad today, sorry. All right, let's talk about some electrolytes and their regulation. I'm only going to take two of them. Your book goes into magnesium and chloride and all such stuff, and I just don't have the, I don't have the energy for it, so you're welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about sodium and potassium, and then only briefly. Uh, we know from our endocrine system that aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption, so you can uh, you know, prevent the loss of sodium by releasing aldosterone, which then also should draw water back in, raise your blood pressure. So aldosterone is a way to, to, to uh, conserve sodium and to stabilize blood pressure. Estrogen has a similar effect, though weaker. On the other side of the coin, atrial natriuretic peptide inhibits sodium reabsor reabsorption, so increases water loss and sodium loss. So if you've got too much sodium, if you've eaten too much salt, you may be inclined to ultimately uh, produce a ANP and get rid of some of it. Progesterone has, an, again, a weak, similar effect. Uh, potassium regulation is pretty simple. Um, you get it in your food. It gets stored mostly inside of your cells. It leaks out over time. You pump it back in. It leaks out. It pump it back in. This is a constant, uh, you know, battle. You're always fighting the sodium and potassium gradients. But if you have too much of it, it's bad. If you have too much potassium extracellular, if you have it outside in your interstitial fluid and in your blood, um, it, it can cause a uh, heart rate. Uh, malfunctions, like some disruption in your heartbeat. Matter of fact, to the point where the lethal injection uh, sequence that they give you if you've been a bad person in a probably a bad state, uh, the last shot is uh, potassium chloride, just potassium chloride, KCL. I could take a glass of that and drink it, I'd be fine. Um, but if I inject it into my, my blood, it's going to cause my heart to, the action potential is going to stop uh, working and my heart will stop. Don't freak out. Go ahead and eat your bananas and fruit and whatever, and you're going to be okay. Because uh, that's not nearly the concentration that it takes to kill you, and plus you've got a digestive system. In order to get rid of it, you just secrete it. Your urinary system is going to pump it out into the tubule, and uh, uh, you're going to urinate it out. Uh, this is promoted by aldosterone. So strangely, aldosterone gets you to save sodium, but gets you to get rid of potassium. Lastly, and very briefly, is our acid-base balance. I've got three different uh, mechanisms that will help you regulate it. There's what we call chemical buffers, and we know we remember the bicarbonate uh, uh, carbonic acid switch from ANP1, I think, where if I want to if my blood is too basic, if it's too alkaline, I want to liberate some hydrogen ions. In doing so, the blood uh, pH will go back down and vice versa. A phosphate buffer works in a similar way and a, there's a protein buffer system that works in a similar way. I'm not, different molecules obviously, but I'm not going into detail. Respiratory buffers. Now this is simple. This is just, right, you're breathing. If you breathe deeper and more rapidly, you're getting rid of a lot of CO2. Getting rid of a lot of CO2 is going to cause a pH shift towards the basic set, uh, end of the scale. So you can actually decrease the acidity of your blood by breathing heavier and deeper. And vice versa, if you're breathing shallow uh, and more slowly, your blood will drift into towards the acidic end of the scale. But these are not like big drifts, right? This is just like tweaking it. Uh, anecdotal story here. I told a student that, I told a class once that theoretically, if you have 
uh, acid indigestion, the, you, get those H, you get those hydrogen ions from your blood, and if I breathe heavily and deeply long enough, I should be able to raise the pH of my blood, which should decrease my, uh, my, uh, my acid indigestion or my heartburn. And a student came back and said, I tried that, and it worked. I'm not saying to try it, because you can actually hyperventilate, but uh, maybe a couple of deep breaths couldn't hurt. Lastly, your renal mechanisms, and this is going to be dealing with that uh, bicarbonate again. So if you want to decrease, you want to make your blood more acidic, uh, get rid of some bicarbonate, because bicarbonate tends to hook up with hydrogen. If you're getting rid of bicarbonate, the hydrogens have less things to hook up with, and the pH will go down. Conversely, if you want to get rid of, if you want to make your pH higher, if you want to get your blood pH up, uh, your kidneys will secrete more hydrogen ions, kind of the flip side of the secreting uh, bicarbonate. As Toto.